Hello, I'm Andrew Walsh. I work part-time as a teaching fellow at the University of Huddersfield and part-time for myself on other projects, including playful consultancy, making learning games and running workshops. I'm also part of the SILIP Information Literacy Group and we're always interested in collaborating with other people who are interested in information literacy. A little while ago, my daughter was talking with a group of friends about what their parents do for a living and she described me as a librarian who teaches grown-ups how to play. So I'm also a playbrarian, hence my Twitter handle on the screen. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about play, games and gamification. I'll mention the invitations to play, which I'm particularly interested in at the moment. I'll also describe some of the play, games and gamification interventions I've been involved with over the last few years. There are lots of definitions of play, but I quite like these as they seem to give the attribute of play to help us point at something and decide if it's play or not. You can hopefully see a lot of connections between the brief list Brown gives and the more wordy classic definition from Homo Ludens above. Some of the key points to draw from these definitions are that play is always voluntary. You can't force people to play, just encourage them or invite them to do so. Often the idea of a magic circle of play, which is first mentioned in Homo Ludens, <coughs> come out of these definitions, where people almost step inside a different world when playing, where they can lose track of time and see things from other people's points of view, to the idea of the diminished consciousness of self. They can also be freed up to make their own rules, enabling a lot of creativity to happen in play activities. These definitions feed into some of the benefits of play in education and in libraries that people can often see, especially around low-risk social engagement, enabling creativity and being able to see things from another's point of view. Generally though, I try not to get too focused on what play is, and I'd say that if you think you're playing, then you are, whatever the formal definitions say. Games are sometimes just described as play with the rules, and often people talk about playing games as being completely different things. I prefer to think of them more like this though, with games and play sitting on a spectrum. Calwell puts it really nicely by splitting play into two types, Padia and Ludus. Padia is tends to be where everyone agrees is play, with it being very free, imaginative or creative. Ludus is what people tend to agree is definitely a game or a sport. The recently departed Bernie de Coven used to split up the difference between these two ends, between the games and the play, as in a game community, the rules and officials decide if the players are good enough to play. If not, they change the players. In a play community, the players decide if the game is fun enough to play. If not, they change the rules. In reality, however, there isn't really a difference between playing games. They just have different quantities of these two types of play in them. So I see games as a great way of enabling play. Gamification is slightly odd. Definitions tend to say something like using game elements in non-game settings, but it's often used in business contexts and may be criticised as badgification, so giving points and badges to nudge behaviour, but not much more to it than that. For example, lots of the people these days have activity trackers like Fitbits, which could be described as gamification of health activities. In amongst all the business app applications, often trying to engage users, gamification is sometimes used to refer to using game-like activities in education. Because these things tend to get mixed together though, it's often probably best to think of as gamification as something based around increasing engagement or changing behaviour and any game-like activities in education as game-based learning. It's worth pointing out at this point that public play is a political act. It demonstrates to anybody watching an attitude towards life, towards education, towards society. 
an attitude that tends towards experimentation, challenge, social fairness and an embracing of the power of fun. This is an attitude that's sometimes expected of children, but it's a lot less likely to be seen as acceptable for adults. So we need permission to play from ourselves and from others. It's easier for children to get this permission compared to adults, but it can still be difficult. Any public demonstration and signalling of play invites others to play, whether directly in that act itself or through other activities that echo that play. It gives others ex implicit permission to play in their turn, and permission, whether it's publicly given or given by the players to themselves, is a critical factor in enabling play. When I talk about this in person, I give lots of little permissions to play to people in the room. When you create a playful experience in libraries, it's incredibly important to think about this issue and give as clear a signal as possible in multiple ways that it's okay to play in your library. This is because any public space, including libraries, comes with social expectations related to behaviour. We need to give social signals that play is okay especially when preconceived ideas may say that it's not always acceptable. The next few slides briefly run through some playful activities I've introduced into libraries. For this one, escape rooms, and most of the other examples I'm going to briefly mention, I've included links at the end to find out more information about them. In some cases, there are games that can be downloaded, but also openly available articles where I've written about my experiences and a few other bits and pieces as well. But back to escape rooms. Escape rooms are normally spaces that shut you inside with a team of people. You need to work collaboratively to solve a series of puzzles before finally solving a puzzle that lets you escape from that room. I've used the idea of an escape room in a box for some activities this is an escape room type idea, but self-contained within a series of lockable boxes that I can bring into any teaching space. The biggest benefit of this is that it instantly creates a type of magic circle. It's a playful space where the rules of normal life do not apply. It gives clear permission to play within the space bounded by that escape room box, so it makes it easy for people to start playing. I've used it for live inductions, particularly for those groups who might find a UK university library a strange and a scary environment, but I've also used it for information literacy teaching in certain ways. I've used Lego in a few ways, often inspired by the Lego series play approach developed by the Lego group in association with the German university. It can be difficult to use effectively. You do need to be skilled within this approach to do it effectively, but it can be quite powerful. I've included it here as a way of enabling people to think playfully with their hands. I often refer to this as embodied cognition. This can help people understand difficult ideas and to problem solve in different ways. I'll use similar ideas with students drawing images or creating collages of images to reflect on topics and to deepen their understanding. But Lego is a quite accessible approach to this as it requires no skill to build models with. <clears throat> I may get students to build their literature review out of Lego and talk about the problems or barriers they find to creating that review. I sometimes get them to build their ideal library out of Lego to discuss the services that they expect to see and to give us an opportunity to talk about the services they didn't realise we offered. It always seems to go down well and there's often unexpected material that comes up that just wouldn't emerge otherwise, leading to some great discussions. This is my favourite way of being playing to my own classrooms. I also run workshops, by the way, showing people a process to create their own educational games. I tend to use card games, although I've used board games as well, just because they're fairly cheap to produce and are very portable. I can easily take enough card games for a class of 50 people across campus. I use card games to teach search skills, to introduce a range of sources of information, and to teach students how to reference effectively uh, amongst other activities. I'm currently creating one to help research students and staff to identify good quality 
conferences and to filter out ones that might not be worth submitting papers to. These sort of games tend to encourage quite structured play and are closer to being active learning activities than what we might think of as free play, but can be incredibly effective in encouraging group discussion and in teaching ideas that people just wouldn't understand after a lecture style session. I've used challenge cards with a few different groups of people over recent years and I see them as effective and powerful ways of increasing team working and communication between different groups but also as a very enabling way of encouraging exploration of a physical or a virtual space and the example of the slide on the slide we gave these cards to a group of new students as a way of playfully encouraging them, encouraging them to explore the campus, including the library. So they felt comfortable coming back into these spaces for the rest of the time at the university. I've also used it to try and break down barriers among staff in different departments at my university, giving weekly tasks to staff. Last but not least, Eid Elementary. This was our gamification project where we tried to encourage use of the library in a playful way. I can't show you what it looks like because we switched it off last year uh, after several years of running it. We just switched off our library management system horizon which fed all the data into Lemon Tree and they're getting used to a new one, Alma, instead. Hopefully we'll be able to do something similar again once we've got used to our new uh, system. Students at the university had an option to register with Lemon Tree, which then fed some basic library usage data into the system and shared it publicly. This included when they came into the library, because they scanned their cards to come into the, to the entrance barriers, when they borrowed and returned books, and when they accessed the electronic resources. It also allowed a small amount of extra data to be gathered within Lemon Tree itself, like rating books, leaving reviews, and sharing of information with groups of friends. It had limited interaction with Facebook as well. Lemon Tree took that data and offered the electronic badges, points, and levelling up of their character to tell the story of their time interacting with the library. We tried to offer points and badges that encouraged a, encouraged a range of behaviours we saw as potentially positive such as increased points of borrowing more material or for coming into the library at quieter times. It's hard to separate what impact Lemon Tree had from all the other influences at university, but it was overwhelmingly positively received by users. And in surveys, the users self-reported increased usage of the library, thanks to the gamified experience. At its peak, we had between 5 and 10% of the university registered for Lemon Tree, which is what we aimed for. These sort of approaches rarely get above 10%, so we aimed at the 10% who traditionally engage less with library resources. It was developed by an external company for us who sold it to a few other universities too. Sam, shown on the screen, was one of the main developers along with Shay at the company running in the halls. It's worth saying that although it was well received by users, it never got past the most basic functionality that I wanted. To be really effective, it needed to go beyond the simple points and badges and enable a lot stronger social interactions, as well as flexibility for people to build their own challenges within it. If I was to do another gamification project along similar lines, it would include the ability to develop quests in this way as well as including data from elsewhere in the university and information skills uh, materials. So we've talked about some definitions to give an idea of what play, games and gamification are, but they really belong on a spectrum and any type of game can enable more play to take place. I've run through a few ways I've used play and games and gamification. The last couple of slides give some links to further materials on these. I've not really had time to talk about the benefits of these approaches, but I have written stuff on this as well, and these are linked to from the final two slides. 
So, thank you all for listening to this short presentation. This is where to find me online, most often on Twitter, but there's the email addresses as well, and my website, innovativelibraries.org.uk. Thank you, and goodbye.